Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Season 9, Episode 36 of the DFO Fantasy Podcast, presented to you by Betway. If you're going to place a bet, bet on Betway. Please play responsibly. Ontario only. It must be 19 years of age or older. I'm your host, Brock Segan. With me, as always, we have Dylan D. Berthium and Michael Biebs. Bondi, fellas, we have made it to the final Fantasy Ooh. Hockey regular season episode of the season. It has been a long ride this year. It's been a long nine years of talking about fantasy hockey, but uh, hopefully the listeners uh, have enjoyed the ride again this year. Hopefully we have lots of people still tuning in and have uh, fantasy hockey championships hinging on the words that we are about to speak because uh, as far as I can tell, the listenership is still very high, which means we have lots of people still alive. So that is always good to see. Uh, D. How are you feeling on this last regular season episode of the season? Doing pretty good. Uh, I got four of the five leagues locked up, really sweating the fifth right now. Currently holding on to a playoff spot. Need to win this week in order to keep it that way. But uh, hasn't been the best start to the week. I'm not going to lie. So we're hoping for uh, a bit of a turnaround. Lots of games left this weekend. I think there's something like 75 games on Saturday and Sunday. So. Uh, yeah. plenty of time to make it up. I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. And you know what? Maybe the other matchups could swing my way and the fantasy gods will, uh, will shine brightly down on me. Cause we might need some help this week. I do big time. Like kind of how the schedulers, um, made this one happen. Like usually we rip the NHL schedulers cause they put eight games at 7 PM on a Tuesday, but, um, to do this for us, for our fantasy guys, to give us a nice juicy back end, um, just to have teams go at it. I love it. Um, also doing good over here, boys. Three of three in leagues. Luckily, I got to face Brock in one of them, so I could just secure the President's Trophy last week. Um, that really just brought it home. And uh, But no, we're doing good. We're doing good. We are very nervous for the playoff schedule because it is bonkers. Um, so yeah, it's just classic Sweaty Beebs episode. That's about it. Yeah, I locked up first place in both of my redraft leagues this year, which always feels good. I... I not, not my, my two keeper leagues not performing so hot, but building for the future redraft is where it's at. Two of two, first place, president's trophy, lock it up. So the fellows are doing good in fantasy hockey. We're doing good here on a Wednesday evening, Thursday morning when you guys hear this. Uh, Beebs, we were just talking about the NHL schedulers, and that is a perfect segue into what we're going to talk about. We've kind of been talking about this for a few weeks in a row now, just looking ahead to the fantasy hockey playoffs and taking a look at the fantasy hockey schedule. Uh, in in the playoffs, we were looking um, at it a few weeks ago as, as a whole, looking at weeks 24, 25, 26, trying to find trade targets ahead of the fantasy hockey trade deadline. Obviously, that is long gone now. At this point in time, the only roster moves you can make are add drops. So we're going to take a look again at the fantasy hockey playoff schedule just to identify the teams with the best matchups and uh, some of the, the the most amount of games, the most amount of games on light nights to identify which players uh, might be the best waiver wire pickups for the fantasy hockey playoff long haul. Uh, because obviously things have changed from when we talked about this a few weeks ago. Some teams are, are worse defensively than they were before, or some teams are better defensively than they are. Um, so the top of the list. I think they were the top of the list at the time. And again, this is just for skaters. So this is based on the defensive quality of their opponents. And the best schedule moving forward is the Seattle Kraken. And the Seattle Kraken not only uh, have the best overall schedule, but they have the best overall schedule by a mile. And not only is it good for, you know, all three weeks combined, but all three weeks are very good. Like they're, It's not like they have two amazing weeks and one bad week sandwich in the middle. All three weeks, they have a really nice schedule. They've got six of their 12 games on light nights, and, and they have by far the easiest schedule. So, D, we'll start with you. Like If you're looking at the Seattle Kraken, pretty much their entire roster is on waivers. Who are the guys that interest you the most from this team if you could pick them up off the waiver wire right now? Yeah, I mean, you said it. Uh, it's always been one of the team that you can kind of comb through on the wire pretty consistently, uh, say for maybe the likes of Jared McCann and, and Vince Dunn. But uh, I, I mean, can't go wrong with just going off the usage right now. And and right now that's the veneers Everly line, still getting a ton of minutes at 5v5. Obviously, Veneers has been pretty underwhelming uh, to the season to date. But uh, I think Everly in particular, his shot line has been really good lately. So I think he'd be really uh, an interesting play. Uh, Ellie Tolvanen has been up there. Uh, with the two of them as well, also on that top power play unit. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you're not going to be able to scoop, like I said, the likes of Jared McCann off the wire. 
Um, so I think this, you know, best route is just going off the usage and, and grabbing those guys that are seeing big minutes, you know, Bjorkstrand and uh, Burakovsky on that second line with McCann right now is the way it shakes out. And, you know, wouldn't be shocking to see McCann move back to the wing at some point though, these fantasy playoffs. But uh, I think Burakovsky in deeper leagues as well could be um, a, a sneaky ad. He's just 2% owned and he's still kind of rounding into form. His shot volume has really picked up of late uh, over three shots a game across his last six. So uh, I think he's a guy, like I said, that could really help out you or help you out in deeper leagues uh, down the stretch. But in uh, in shallower leagues, I think Everly is probably your best bet. Uh, I think he's available in just under 70% of leagues. And then if you're looking for some help on the back end, as long as Vince Dunn is sidelined, like Justin Schultz hasn't made the most of it yet, but he is kind of uh, locking down that spot on their top power play unit. So if you're looking for some point production from the back end, uh, I think Dunn sounds like he's getting a little bit closer. Uh, to returning, but as long as he's out, that should be Schultz's spot on the top power play unit. Yeah, and Vince Dunn is, is still not practicing, but I don't think he's expected to be out long term. But certainly, whenever whenever he's out, Justin Schultz becomes a little bit more viable. Uh, next on the list is the New York Rangers, and the Rangers' first two weeks of the fantasy hockey playoffs are absolutely outstanding. Um, the, the finals week, though, not so much. They might be a little bit risky, but if you're like one of those teams where it's just like, I'm just lucky to be here. Hopefully we can make a, 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 you know, a dream run to the finals here. Bit of a Cinderella fantasy story. The New York Rangers could be somebody worth picking up. Uh, last week we talked about Jack Roslovich being somebody that you should be giving a roster spot to and giving a little PTO to, and he's performed fairly well. Um, in addition to uh, Jack Roslovich, Deeps, who are you looking for from the New York Rangers moving forward for the next couple of weeks? Yeah, luckily I got a little bit of better choices here than what D got with Seattle. Uh, just one th- quick thing about Seattle, isn't it? I feel like every year since they've joined the league, they are the team to have players from when it comes to fantasy playoffs. I think that their scheduler, I don't, I don't know what it is, but it's a common trend that I've noticed last three years. They've always had the hefty playoff schedule. So maybe something to look forward to next year, but definitely something to focus on this year. Um, one player that I, you mentioned, Roslovic, he's obviously one who I would say go after immediately. Uh, one player who was a little bit less owned than I expected, though, uh, was Alexis Lafreniere out in, or, well, in, with the Rangers. That's who we're talking about. 39% owned right now, though. That's kind of why I wanted to mention him. He's not quite high enough that it's like, okay, you're, you can't get a hold of him. But he is out there in a lot of leagues. He has 13 points in his last 15 games and 44 shots during those 15 games. That's what I kind of love from Lafreniere. He is sh- proving that he can just shoot the lights out. He's kind of given us a little bit of a glimpse of what, what made him a first overall pick a couple years ago. And uh, maybe we're getting a little bit of a late bloom here, but he does look fantastic. He looks like he's really fitting in um, on that team as the year goes on. Another one who I want to keep an eye on uh, is actually, if you're in a deeper league, Alex Wenberg, someone who they traded for recently. He's got seven points in the last 30 days, so the last month or so. But the thing that's kind of stood out for me is he's got three power play points, and he is occupying that second power play with Rozlovich. Um, they, they've had a tiny bit of success early on, so it's someone very deep leagues that you can keep an eye on if you can't get your hands on someone like Lafreniere. Also, if you are a guy who is in the league or a, a, a person who's in a league where goaltenders are out there. Uh, keep an eye on Jonathan quick. If uh, he's usually he's owned in a lot of leagues, but I do know as the year comes down to the late, late times, people will drop guys like a backup goalie. So if you can get your hands on that, certainly worth it. And finally a shout out to Capo Caco. He's really only scoring at the moment, but uh, 3% owned again, deeper. I would probably take him before I take Wenberg um in deeper leagues but as far as they go if you're in a league where Lafreniere is there I'd almost pick him up regardless because he is just on a heater um yeah no thank you New York for giving us a few options otherwise though like Panarin just cannot be stopped so yeah anyone who's playing with him Lafreniere has been with Trocek and Panarin all year and they performed really well Lafreniere has had a really really nice season uh third on the list here going nuts now yeah, yeah it, it is the Edmonton Oilers uh again another team that's got a really nice schedule in the playoffs uh, mostly the finals week, they only have five games, which isn't, you know, there's a few teams with six, but they have a really, really good championship week schedule and four of their five games are on light night. So if you can get there, they have seven light night games of the 12 remaining for them. So really, really nice schedule D obviously this is a team that's super top heavy with the likes of McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl, Zach Hyman. So there's the options are kind of few and far between, but who from the Edmonton Oilers excites you the most right now? Yeah, I think there's only a couple of names to mention that, to your point, aren't already uh, widely owned. You're not really going to find them on the wire or in any, or in the wire in any sort of format. Uh, but Adam Henrique, you know, we talked about how his upside was probably going to take a hit now that he wasn't seeing over 20 minutes a night like he was with the Ducks in all situations. 
Uh, and just as we kind of anticipated, has really settled into that role as the third line center, which isn't great for his fantasy upside. I think one thing to note is they did stick Ryan Nugent Hopkins on that line um, last night. I'm not sure how long that that's going to last, but in the meantime, you know, that certainly can't hurt. Henrik's upside was a lot better than what he was playing with uh, before they dropped RNH down the lineup and he did score a goal uh, last night. So I think in shallower leagues, probably your best bet. I just I don't really anticipate him um, getting back into that top six anytime soon or seeing time with the top powerful unit. But in deeper leagues, I do think Warren Fogel uh, could be a nice little addition. He's available in 93% of leagues. Shot volume has been really consistent uh, all season long. That hasn't changed of late. He's got 13 shots on goal in his last five, four points over that stretch, uh, and really seems to have settled in on the wing of Leon Dreisaitl at 5v5. So uh, his power play time is super inconsistent, sometimes not even on the second unit. Uh, but at 5v5, if he's rolling 15 minutes a night with dry saddle and deeper leagues, that's going to be worth taking a punt on, especially with all these light nights like you highlighted, Brock. Yeah, Ryan McLeod, Warren Fogle, and Leon Dreisaitl have formed a pretty decent second line. Whenever that trio has been together, they've performed quite well. I think the real issue is the Oilers have seemed to be a team that likes to shuffle things around quite a bit. And you don't really know how long a line like that is going to last, especially if they lose a game or two in a row. So. Uh, yeah, they make for great streaming targets when they're there and when they're not, not so much. But maybe the addition of Adam Henrique was really what they needed to to make sure they could safely play those guys up in the top six and uh, still lengthen the lineup out. A couple more teams we're going to talk about really quickly. Let's talk about the LA Kings. They're a team that have been on a bit of a roller coaster throughout the majority of this season. You know, really, really good stretch to start the season first few months looking like an absolute juggernaut then looking like a team that could never win a game again and now looking like a team that has you know rediscovered that early season form uh the first week of the playoffs week 24 the schedule is not ideal for them but as you head into week 25 and 26 absolutely juicy matchups the matchups are absolutely outstanding fourth best schedule over the fantasy hockey playoffs uh in total uh you know Kopitar, Fiala to know uh, Trevor Moore, Adrian Kempe, Quinn Byfield, Pierre-Luc Dubois heating up. Like, I mean, they've got so many forwards to choose from. Beebs, when you're looking at the wire, which guys are the most available? Which guys would you be most interested in targeting from the LA Kings? All right, so I'm going to follow a similar theme, go under 50% for my first one, and then I'll give you guys some juicy ones at the end here. But Quinton Byfield, currently with triple position eligibility, that's center, left wing, and right wing. He's 40 per six. 46% owned, and he is on line one and power play one. So if you can get a hold of him, he's your guy that you kind of want If because most of these other guys are in the 90s, 80% owned. So, yeah, if you can get your hands on Byfield, I mean, you're pretty much getting close to the same value as you would as some other guys there, and I think that's an absolute steal. But as we look into some players that are a little bit less owned, Philip Deneau on second line, uh, both power play and line, has been on a bit of a heater lately. Five goals in his last nine, seven points, kind of just showing what he could do when he just gets all that ice because you know we know who philip deno is he is a two-way player but when uh when when the offense starts clicking it's good to get behind that he's also a plus seven during that time and he's shooting the puck a lot more so at 24 percent, he's certainly worth a look but also if you're uh if, if you're going very deep if we're looking at the below five percent um rookie alexis laferriere I, I mean not not alexis laferriere i just want to name do the same ish name um, he has six points in the last, in the last month, which is basically the same production as they've been getting from their, eh, their, their middle lines putting up about eight across the board on average, but that's, that's just a little bit less. And for a guy who's 1% owned, if you're in a keeper league, it might even be worth throwing a flyer at him. Um, he has proven that he can get it done. He's been consistent all year long. I don't, I don't think anyone knows that this guy's even a rookie in the league, which is hilarious because he's been one of the more consistent rookies. So, um, definitely worth a shout out there, but yeah, LA is, uh, is hooking me up with some options. So I got two juicy teams there. But, uh, but who else has a nice schedule in the playoffs here, Brock? Yeah, the last thing we're going to talk about, uh, next on the list is the Calgary Flames. Uh, but they don't have very many late night games, only four to speak of. And the schedule is, is pretty mediocre. And that's not a team that's scoring a ton. Like, they do have options. It, it, this is a team that you have to go to. Uh, Igor Sharangovich continues to play well. Andrew Mangiapane seems to be coming around. You know, basically their entire roster, you you know, uh, can stream Hubert Okuznenko. They're all available on the wire. So they're there. But their schedule really doesn't get juicy until the finals week. So we'll probably come back to them here in a couple weeks if you're still kicking around in the finals where the Flames will be among the best streaming targets there. But let's skip ahead to the last team we're going to talk about, and that's going to be the Vancouver Canucks because the Vancouver Canucks have uh, eight of their 11 games remaining in the playoffs. 
are on light nights, which makes them absolutely ideal. There's only one other team that that has that, and that's the Vegas Golden Knights, but their strength of schedule is much, much worse. And sandwiched in between week 24 and 26 is week 25, where they're the only team that plays two games. So you're not really looking to stream them long-term. Where the Canucks players, you definitely are. Three games and two light nights in week 24. Three games and two light nights in week 25. And then they've got five games and four light nights in week 26. So the Canucks, uh, definitely a team that you're going to want to look at. And D, there are some options. We talked about them quite a bit last week, so we don't really need to hammer it home. But just remind the listeners who those guys are, because we were talking about this this being the team that you want to target uh, heading into the playoffs. I mean, yeah, let's get the uh, obvious one out of the way first. If Elias Lindholm, if you're in a shallow league, he's still just 52% on, so the chance he's out there. Even we being buried down the lineup, I'll, I still like to bet on the talent there and him bouncing back in that situation sooner than later. I'd expect for him to be back on that top power play unit sooner than later. So even though the production's fallen off a cliff there, I think he's worth uh, checking in on. But yeah, to your point, if, if we're looking at deeper or more standard formats, uh, the name I like the most actually right now is Connor Garland. Uh, he's got 18 shots on goal in his last six games, playing with Pedersen on that top line uh, alongside Niels Hoglander, who's also a pretty good option as we get into, uh, as you said, these uh, kind of quieter nights down the stretch here and, and with them just being featured so much. Uh, the power play time is limited for Garland. He's on the second power play unit, but they've been experimenting a little bit with that top unit. He's been playing really well at 5v5, so it wouldn't shock me if he gets a look in there uh, sooner than later. But like I said, I think the 5v5 production has been solid enough, uh, and he certainly warrants a little bit more playing time with how well he's been playing lately, like I said. Three shots a game over his last six while playing just over 15 minutes a night. Certainly worth keeping an eye on. And then Niels Hoglander is just another guy that we've uh, talked about for deeper leagues kind of all season long, just how steady he's been uh, in a depth role for them. He's got 20 goals on the season in 67 games. And again, that's being limited pretty significantly with his ice time playing under 12 minutes a night. So another guy who certainly whose play has warranted some additional ice time. He's finally getting that opportunity skate on the top line alongside Pedersen. Again, power play usage. Not fantastic, but if Pai Suter's getting a look on that top unit, uh, I don't see any reason why Hogland or Garland wouldn't be um, given the same opportunity sooner than later. So, again, not guys that I would typically recommend, but to your point, just the fact that they're going to get you so many more um, or so many more extra games in your lineup with all the light nights that they're going to see down the stretch during the fantasy playoffs, I think they're worth taking a roll of the dice and just betting on the quantity of games and hoping that these guys, because they have performed well of late, earn themselves some more ice time. Beebs, you had somebody you wanted to circle back to with uh, the LA Kings before we move on. Yeah, it was someone who I completely missed because he was activated off long-term IR, to, or just, just regular IR, I believe it was today. Long-term was like two weeks ago. Um, but Victor Arvidsson, currently 34% owned. He has zero points, so he has a massive bagel if you go and look at his at his uh, his stats, which is going to keep some people away. But if this is a guy who has proven time and time again he, he loves to shoot. He is a offensive force and he's, you know, they're going to use him that way. So if he comes back, he's healthy. He could definitely find himself a little bit more up in that lineup and certainly worth keeping an eye on Byfield on that top power play. Not that I think that our Arvidsson could um, usurp him, but at the same time, if there any, is anyone who could and would, that is who would step in there. So keep an eye on DFO lines, as we always say, but Arvidsson's someone who's definitely interesting. If he is in a nice juicy spot, I definitely say go get him. If he's not, stay the hell away because uh, it's, it's going to be a little bit tough for him coming off these injuries. Uh, he's probably only going to get 15, 16 minutes a night, but if it's 15, 16 minutes a night in great areas, definitely worth a look. So thanks for circling back to Victor for me, Brad. Yeah, he, he was playing in the top six when he came back. He was actually playing like 17 minutes a night. He's probably more likely just going to end up on a, on a line with yeah. um, Pierre-Luc Dubois moving forward, I would imagine. <laughs> um, and just, just to remind you or to correct you there, he has – Two points in the season, but both assists. Still looking for oh, his first goal. Okay. But the shot volume has been uh, through the roof as normal. Um, so that's it. That's going to do it for the preview of the fantasy hockey playoff schedule. Hopefully a lot of those players are available in your leagues. You can pick them up with your additional roster spots because I know you've been streaming all year. You've been listening to these streamers every single week. So if you're not streaming, what are you doing? Uh, can we uh, can we make a statement too that like every most fantasy teams, you got to be streaming. Like you have to stream. It's so crucial. Like if you have a bottom of your roster guy, you don't have to, but say your roster is conducted in a way where you have a guy that you're thinking about even keeping at all. You might as well just turn that into a streaming spot, especially with fantasy hockey. Yeah. I, I mean, I've been streaming all season long um, in, in my league of record. And then all of a sudden I picked up uh, Kuznetsov and Roslovich and I'm like, I don't want to drop these guys. These are like the bottom of my roster now. And like Kuznetsov especially has been just scorching. So uh, he, you know, we talked, we joked last week about how I was in the spot where I could have people on PTOs right now. And uh, he definitely earned himself a long, long-term contract here 
uh, through the fantasy hockey playoffs. Rozlovich still on his PTO. Uh, but if <laughs> for whatever reason you've already been eliminated from the fantasy hockey playoffs uh, and you're still listening to the show, thank you still for tuning in. I, I understand why you would want to listen to us even if you're eliminated. But uh, we're going to focus a little bit on some keepers right now. And obviously we can't cover – Every single league and, uh, you know, every league is different. So the sizes are going to be uh, – the amount of keepers you have is going to be different. We're never going to be able to answer your exact situation. Uh, but we can maybe help you decide on who to keep and just make some decisions on certain players. So what I've done is put a list of, of names together side by side that have had very similar seasons this year and will pose uh, keeper league managers some tough decisions here in – the off season heading into the fall and maybe you are in this exact situation. And if that's the case, you're welcome. Uh, but if not, hopefully we give you enough information on a specific player that can help you make a decision next year. So we will start. Uh, some of these guys are, are obviously, you know, very, very good. And if you own them both in a league, you might, they, you know, they, your keeper pool might be deep enough that you get to keep both of them. Lucky you, but in the event that it is not, let's talk about Bo Horvat and Robert Thomas. To give you some background here, Bo Horvat currently 29 goals, 33 assists, 62 points in 67 games. Robbie Thomas, uh, 23 goals, 50 assists, 73 points in 69 games. D, haven't heard from you here in a minute. Bo Horvat or Robert Thomas, if you had to pick one to keep next year? Yeah, I think it's an interesting uh, discussion. I think Horvat is no doubt the more reliable goal scorer given that shot volume, but Thomas... Four years younger, he's proven himself to be one of the best playmakers in the NHL. He's a career 15% shooter and has increased his shot volume to over two shots a game this year while still maintaining an elite conversion rate. It's, I believe, the third year in a row where his shot volume has improved. So that's a promising trend for sure. Uh, I think Horvat is an obvious favorite to score more goals next season, but I think overall the difference will be negligible and more than offset by the influx of assists you're getting with Thomas. And again, like I said, he's a guy who still looks to be getting better each season he plays. I think he's still on the right side of the aging curve. So give me Robert Thomas. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm on the same page as you there, D. Also, Brock, I got to say, not to pump your tires, but these were very good keepers. Like, I, I struggled through a couple of them. But uh, but but we'll get through that. But, no, I'm I'm a Robert Thomas stan over here. I, I think the best is still yet to come for this guy. Bo Horvat, you know, it's been a great season. It's awesome to see it. But we know with him, he's going to have to fight to get that point per game every single year. And even if he does have those little bit extra goals, I think, like you said, you know, Thomas is going to outlast him in the other categories. And, and D, you absolutely nailed it. The shots on goal go, going up each year. It's such, such a sexy trend. We love to see that. So that's what, uh, that's what brought me to Robert Thomas. But overall, I think, uh, I think next year, um, I, I also have Horvat maybe scoring, scoring four or five goals, but I got Thomas getting like 20 plus more points. So I, uh, I, I think we're going Robert Thomas on this one. Plus the younger body. We're talking to keeper league here, Robert Thomas, 24 years old, Bo Horvat, 28 years old, not to say it's a lot to consider, but you know, you can still get eight more years of prime out of Robert Thomas, depending on your league's keeper ability or keeper rules and that where Bo Horvat, you might only get three or four. So if we're, uh, if we're giving them the same window there, so just something to think about, but yeah, I think, I think Robbie Thomas takes kick on this one, but, uh, and just general, you know, that team, the Islanders have never, never excited me. Any person kept on that team. Brock, yeah, how do you I feel about this team? I feel the same. Robert Thomas is, is the is the route to go here. My guess, my only concern with him would be like if the Blues decide to like dismantle the roster in the offseason. I don't imagine that's going to be the case. Like I, I think you know maybe Pavel Buchnevich gets moved out, but they do have some expiring contracts that could help bring in a couple of free agents or, or Jake Neighbors or getting better too via, via trade. Yeah, like I do think that the surrounding cast would be the only thing that could hold Robert Thomas back. But I do expect them to continue to insulate him pretty well. And uh, he's somebody that I have some interest in moving forward for sure. So I will agree. It we'll, is a clean sweep for Robbie Thomas. Uh, next on the list, a couple of wingers. Different ages. Again, Cole Caulfield is first. He is 23 years of age. He has 20 goals, 33 assists, 53 points in 68 games. Uh, in his most recent game, he set a career high in games played at 68. So uh, the... You know, durability was always the big concern with him, but he's been uh, pretty reliable so far this year. So 53 points in 68 games. On the flip side, Kevin Fiala, 60 points in 68 games, 22 goals, 38 assists. So very similar stat lines this season. The main difference is Kevin Fiala is four or five years older. He'll be 28 in July. So, uh, Beebs, we'll start with you on this one. Are you going with Cole Caulfield, the younger goal scorer, or Kevin Fiala, the older goal scorer? 
think we might be a little split on this one. And uh, Brock, I hate you for putting on friend of the show, Kevin Fiala, but give me goal score Cole in this one. The younger per or the younger player, not that that really factors into it, but for me, the difference here, Cole Caulfield has 70 four more shots than Kevin Fiala this year. And that in itself as a 23 year old is kind of the stuff that excites me. We saw Fiala probably reach his career high in goals with 33 a couple of years ago. That's kind of where his ceiling's at. And that that's fantastic. Don't get me wrong, but Caulfield's now flirted over 20 goals in three straight seasons. Uh, you talked about his durability. The one year it was just, he got sent down to the AHL. So um, he's not as injury prone. It was just a, a, a quite noticeable one last year, um, which sucked, but yeah, just seeing him play the full season this year, getting these shots. And another thing you mentioned it kind of with Robert Thomas, the surrounding cast plays a big part for me here. I don't necessarily love Montreal head to toe, but I do love that first line of Suzuki, Slavkowski and Caulfield. And it seems like they are cooking. They're going to cook. That's the line of the future. And when they're looking like they have, it really just excites me as a whole because in this case, with LA being so deep, it might actually help Caulfield that Montreal is so thin because he's going to be eating a ton of ice going forward. Like I said, I think uh, Caulfield has the potential to be a 300 plus shot guy, and Fiala really doesn't, in my opinion. Um, he might be able, he, or he's at least going to fight a lot harder than Caulfield will. So I'm going to go on Caulfield because I don't think we've seen the best yet, where Fiala. We probably have, and I love, I love, love, love betting on potential. Um, you guys know you play in leagues with me. I am the king of king of potential, even if it's it just bites me in the ass every time. But I gotta go for uh, Caulfield on this one. I'm hoping we might have a split though, because this was one of the harder ones for me. I will admit. But D, what do you think? No, I'm with you. I'll take the elite shot volume with Caulfield. I think at times there can just be too many mouths to feed in Los Angeles, and it kind of eats into the playing time of a guy like Fiala. While Caulfield will continue to be a focal point of a young and improving team in Montreal. Uh, but yeah, that shot volume views, like you said, 263 shots on goal in 68 games, the 23 year old that's off the charts. I think he's been pretty unfortunate to score as few goals. As he has shooting just 7.6 in the season. So I honestly wouldn't be surprised if he's among the league leaders and goals next season. And uh, I, I agree with you. You don't need to play on the deepest team to maximize your fantasy production. All you need is a pair of talented linemates and, Caulfield has certainly found that in Suzuki and Slavkovsky. They played, I think, over 500 minutes together this year. Um, so I think it's one of the stickier combinations going into next season. And uh, I love all three of their upside and certainly Caulfield uh, going into next year. Yeah, and, and I even think, like, obviously Suzuki's been excellent, but um, if they can somehow get in, in somebody who might be a little bit more offensive, it could help uh, Caulfield even more. Suzuki's definitely a, an elite top six center probably best uh, suited to be, you know, more of that two-way shutdown type of forward as, as the guy you go to to lead your offense. But nonetheless, that trio has been super, super good. And Caulfield and Suzuki have been super comfortable with each other for a number of years now. So um, as much as I love Kevin Fial, I do agree. Like, I I think that, you know, basically heading into next season, Cole Caulfield's floor kind of feels um, just as safe as Kevin Fiala's, which I don't think was the case necessarily coming into the season. But that shot volume, um, is absolutely tremendous. And it's going to, you know, continue to, to main, help him maintain an elite floor, not an elite floor, but a very good floor. Uh, so yeah, I'll go with the Caulfield potential as well. I was really hoping I would, I would generate some splits here with some tough questions, but so far two clean sweeps D we'll come back to you on this one. This is, this is probably the most difficult for me because these are two of my absolute favorites, but Matt Boldy or Seth, Jarvis. So Matt Boldy obviously uh, was one of my breakouts coming into the season. Uh, missed some time at the start of the year. 24 goals, 31 assists, 55 points so far in 62 games. Uh, Seth Jarvis on the other side has played 69 games, 55 points, 25 goals, and 30 assists. So uh, yeah, very, very similar stat lines. The exact same number of points, basically the exact same number of goals, exact same number of assists. Uh, just Look at the time fewer. of ice. Yeah, just a seven fewer. Um, yeah, they're, they're one second apart in average time on ice. I mean, they couldn't be more similar other than the fact that Matt Boldy has played seven fewer games. So it doesn't get more difficult than this. Uh, D, are you riding with Matt Boldy or are you Team Jarvis here? Uh, I think anyone who's listened to the podcast for a few years now won't be surprised to know I'm going with Boldy here. Uh, I like Seth Jarvis a lot, but I think the shot volume is better with Boldy. I think the role is much more secure, uh, kind of similar to what we were just talking about with Caulfield versus Fiala. The Wild are a very top-heavy team, and that means they're going to need to rely on Boldy to be a major contributor next season. I think Carolina's depth at times can be a detriment to Jarvis, and I think his role atop that lineup is a lot less secure as a result. We've really seen Boldy's production spike since they put together that top line of himself, 
Kaprizov and Erickson Eck and Boldy. 22 points in his last 19 games, 62 shots on goal on that stretch while playing just under 20 minutes in that night. I really do think that sort of production is his baseline going into next season. That line has got some of the better danger chances per 60 with an expected goals for percentage of 63%. I expect them to continue to carry the wild next year for Boldy to continue to see major minutes at 5v5 and on the power play and it's time in his career where he's still just getting better every year. I think Jarvis has got a fantastic future ahead of him as well, but just don't believe his role will be as secure at the top of that lineup. So I will gladly go with Boldy here. Yeah, I uh, I hate to do it, fellas, but we are three for three. I'm also going Matt Boldy. But I will admit, if I'm making a keeper list, I'm pretty sure I have these guys right next to each other in ranking. They are so close. This one is actually insane i actually thought that you went to time on ice brock and we're just looking at people when i when i originally was going through it but just the age two both being the exact same age um like d said you know boldy's boldy's got that position locked carolina has we've seen so many people let us down on carolina over the years svechnikov owners are still mad at svechnikov ones who have owned them for the last three years um you know it's just there's too too many mouths to feed we've said it and uh and that's why i love boldy i i'm i'm with d there too i think he's having a down year almost but to have still this much production it just goes to show what he can actually do there's also a couple pieces in minnesota that really excite me and marco rossi is one of them i think if that guy can fully click it in he's already clicking but if he can really click it in we've seen joel erickson go off become a point per game player things are kind of starting to form there and that top six is where i like it um carolina's top nine is so good that they have to play their top nine that's the issue so i'll go boldy again but like i said they are right next to each other also the thing that really pushed them ahead those 28 extra shots for boldy in seven less games it just goes to show that he's a little bit more trigger happy than jarvis so i uh we've talked about how shots lead to fantasy production it's been what i've been preaching all day so i'll go boldy here um to keep things lame but very cool yeah I, I I'm not gonna I'm not gonna change it either. It's three for three, clean sweep. I'll go boldy. Um, you know I absolutely love Seth Jarvis. Uh, Beebs, yeah. you said that you're a Robert Thomas stand. I've been a Seth Jarvis stand for a while here. Uh, um, but I, I think the one thing that's freaked me out a bit, you guys have sort of touched on it, is we've seen Seth Jarvis play with Jordan Stahl and Jordan Martin a, a lot this year, and that's not a huge issue considering how much or how many minutes that team or that line plays. Uh, but still, that's not like the most offensively potent line. And if he was playing in the top six this entire season, I do think he's got probably more offensive production to this point than, than Boldy. But he has he was stuck with like Jordan Stahl for a 20-game stretch. It's just not going to yeah. do it for you. That's so, tough too um, because Jordan Stahl's taking all the defensive – um, well, exactly yeah like, obviously, off, so that means they're starting in the other end always yeah which is not good and that, that is the main concern like if you would ask me this question you know 25 games ago when he was pretty much always in that top six i think i would have leaned jarvis but uh yeah boldly i think is separating himself a little bit with that shuffling next i mean we i'm putting you guys through the grinder here i mean these are some of our absolute favorite players d i know this one's absolutely crushing you because uh, you've been really preaching Wyatt Johnson and Owen Tippett uh, for a while now. And, and how do you decide uh, between these two young budding superstars? They've both been absolutely tremendous. Wyatt Johnson is on an absolute heater. I mean, we we, we talked about him a lot this year, um, but we, you know, we talked about him probably a month ago saying like how he's still available on the wire. You need to get him because it's coming and he went through a cold stretch and it's like, it's gone, right? Like he has now 53 points in 69 games where that, that cold stretch was, you know, he's completely put it in his rear view mirror and has been on an absolute heater. Uh, but Owen Tippett just been very, very good as well. 25 goals, 20 assists, 45 points in 65 games for Tippett, 26 goals, 27 assists, 53 points in 69 games for Johnson. Uh, the main Difference is the shot volume for, for Owen Tippett. 247 shots for Owen Tippett, 178 shots for Wyatt Johnson. So, D, I, I mean, this is as tough as it gets for you. You have been preaching about these two for pretty much uh, two seasons now. How do you decide between the two? And if you own both of them, who are you going? I, I think Tippett certainly has his niche. He can be incredibly valuable in leagues that reward shots on goal and hits. Uh, but in general, I just think the upside with Johnson is just too good to ignore. I mean, you touched on it, Brock, 26 goals, 27 assists in 69 games as a 20-year-old. There's no major red flags in his underlying numbers. He's shooting 14.6 on the season, on ice at 10.5%, 10 
seems to get better every single game he plays. And there is room for his ice time and his role to grow on top of all of that. Just 17 minutes a night this season. He's been limited to a role on the second power play unit. He's going to take over for either Jamie Benn or Joe Pavelski on that top unit sooner than later. And I think that Duchesne line sees a lot less run next season. And we see the line of Johnson and Stankovan be on par with the usage for Hins and Robertson. I think it might not have season, but I really do think within a couple of years' time, we'll be talking about Johnson as the most productive player on this team and a no doubt first round fantasy selection. So in keeper leagues, I think you just got to hold on tight to that upside and, and, and hold tightly to Wyatt Johnson. But like I said, banger, shot leagues, Owen Tippett can certainly do a, a nice little job for you. But uh, yeah, upside just too good with Wyatt. Again, not to make it boring, but boys, give me Wyatt Johnston. Um, I got to go with him too. 20 years old versus 25 is the first telltale sign of me going with him. That five-year difference is quite a gap. But one thing about Johnson that really stood out this year is his versatility. If we were talking even a couple months ago when he was strict center, I would have been a little bit more lenient on Tippett just because we talked about how deep centers are. But now that he's proven that he can move in and out of that lineup, he can play on that top line. I think he's he's gone to a whole new level. And another thing, I haven't brought up an OHL stat all day, but Owen Tippett's career high in the OHL was 75 on pretty solid teams. Um, and then our boy Wyatt Johnson put up 124 in a season. That's a 50 point difference. So um, not to say that it's much, but if we're talking keeper leagues, you got to look at these little things. These are the underlying numbers that come out in the wash. If your league is a league that does two points for a goal, maybe consider tip it. But yeah, this is the one time where I'm going to say go with the guy who shoots less. But either way, I think both of these guys make phenomenal keepers again. It was this one was a tough choice again. Like as much as we are agreeing on all of these, they are really hard choices. And I think most of them are really either way. You're pretty much set. But uh, but yeah, this one this one was good. But uh, I got to go Wyatt. Just that 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 versatility, that lineup in Dallas, everything about it. Uh, Philly scares me too. I don't, I don't. You never know what's going on over there. He could just get healthy tomorrow. <laughs> Wouldn't just for funny. like smiling at courts the wrong way or they'll give them an a next week and then healthy them on friday who knows yeah um man like this i i thought this was going to be way more interesting and way more fun but this is just a clean sweep yet again uh why johnson for me just to give you an idea of how hot he's been uh he has 20 points 11 goals nine assists in his last 16 games over that span he has 60 shots which would be a 307 shot pace over 82 games so like if he finally or like suddenly is like a 300 shot a season type of player or anything close to that next year uh why johnson's game just takes an, an entirely different step and he's on par uh with owen Tippett shot line, which is not exactly the case at the moment um okay this next one's very interesting because beebs you won't be able to use um age as a deciding factor because they were all selected in the 2020 nhl draft they went first second and fourth they all play on the wing of their respective teams and they are all currently in a playoff spot we'll see if that continues uh but alexi lafreniere we talked about a little bit already quint byfield we talked about a little bit already and lucas raymond we have not touched on but if you had to pick one of the three beeps are you going alexi lafreniere quint byfield or lucas raymond next year this was hard. This one was very hard. I did. I literally had to walk away from my computer, come back to it when I was doing research and make sure that I was making the right choice. Um, Brock, I'm going to satisfy you here. Uh, give me Lucas Raymond here. And honestly, I wanted to go Lafreniere. He is the clear winner in shots on goal. He gets that buck on that. Um, and, you know, that leads to production like we've talked about. But Lucas Raymond there's something about the Detroit chem that's going on. We've talked about it with other lines, but I could just see him sitting there with, you know, Larkin, if they can re-sign Kane, even if they can't, th that power play is just on fire right now. It is, it is going crazy. And to see something like that, um, you know, it, it happened while Larkin's out. It just gives me excitement for the future for them. I think that he just fits the best there. I think if you're going for points, I should stop rambling. If you're going for points, Lucas Raymond, if you're going for, goals i'm going lafreniere quentin byfield no matter what is the third on my list because i think that he is very assist driven heavy and we just you know we've, we've seen as far as blooming goes he's the latest of the bloomers but uh yeah lucas raymond for me here i i i, I really really struggled between him and laugh but yeah it's just it's just that that commitment that detroit's already made to him just consistently being on the first line consistently being on the top power play it's just something that I don't know. I can guarantee you um, with Alexis Lafreniere it just might not happen. Um, that that's a deep lineup and they have other 
players have been drafted really high who could get hot and take a spot like Capo, Capo Caco, et cetera. So um, I think the safest play for me would be Lucas Raymond, but I'm hoping we have a bit of a, a bit of a tear up here. D make, make me and the fans happy. Come on. I mean, I'm assuming Brock's going to go with Raymond. I'm going to go with Raymond. I'm just not sure. Oh, God. It's Byfield and that <laughs> year are going to be able to carve out. Uh, maybe we should have talked about this ahead of time. But, uh, yeah, I just think those teams are a little bit too deep. Again, it's the kind of the same things we've talked about, too many mouths to feed. Uh, I think Raymond got a much better chance to get up around 20 minutes a game. He's proven to be an elite shoot already. We've seen his volume improve of late as well. If that's something he can carry next season alongside healthy Dylan Larkin, I think we could finally see the true breakout of what we've been waiting for. Um, though I don't think you can go wrong with either of these three. Uh, and I get three guys, three players that I think are still getting better year to year. So probably a harder one to call, but if I had to base it just off what I think will happen next season, uh, I do like Raymond the most. So, uh, sorry to the listeners. Cause, uh, yeah, we're just repeating each other at this point. Yeah, it, it's awful here. I'll try to give uh, something a little bit different. I I'm definitely going Lucas Raymond, but, um, <laughs> he has been like the Red Wings are on such a bad slide right now. And, they like for the most part, the entire roster looks like absolute shit, except for Lucas Raymond. He has been unbelievable. He has seven goals in his last five games. He is willing if them you, into the playoffs. If you take a look at the last two months, he has 25 points in his last 24 games. He's averaging over two shots per game during that stretch as well. Um, this was like a make or break year for Lucas Raymond because what we saw from him last year wasn't great. And he's been on a heater lately. He's really turned into a game breaking type of player over the last couple months. And if this is a sign of who this player truly is heading into next season, he could be an absolute fantasy stud. So if you have him in keeper leagues, like I, I think he has that game breaking point per game talent that right now I'm not sure that Lafreniere or Byfield necessarily possessed to be a point per game player in fantasy hockey. So um, just to circle back to Lafreniere for a second though, Beebs, they have made a pretty big commitment to him this year. He's been basically strapped yeah, to that second line. I do than... think, I do think that he's probably fairly secure in that top six and he's he's had moments where he looks outstanding but it's just they're few and far between it seems and in you know even while Trocek and Panarin are having these outstanding breakout seasons his numbers are still lagging behind a lot of that has to do with not being on power play one but Lucas Raymond like you guys have already alluded to he he's the dog in that lineup right now and hopefully that continues for the Red Wings sake and I do think that he could be an absolute stud next year. Uh, okay, two I think more to uh, get here. I think that's three names that we can already say as early sleepers for next season though cuz I I I don't know about you guys but I think across the board all of these guys are going to be a little bit It depends on. man. It, it depends how how Raymond finishes this season. If he somehow maintains what he's doing right now, um, I do think he's going to rise up the boards a little bit. The other two, I do think will still probably be slept on a little bit, but yeah, no, I, like all three guys, I definitely want stocking again next year. This year, I have tons of Lafreniere uh, from the waiver wire. Raymond, I was a draft pick of mine, so feel pretty good about Lucas's recent play. Okay, let's focus in on a defenseman and a goalie for the next two. Uh, D, we'll come back to you here. Uh, Jake Sanderson or Moritz Sider? I want to hear who you say first because Beeps has promised us that we're going to be different on this one. So let's start with you, D, and see if Beeps <laughs> is just going to change it up, change it up, sake, or if he's actually got one different. Yeah, I'm really not that high on Jake Sanderson from a fantasy perspective. So uh, this one's pretty easy for me to go with Mo Sider. I, I think they're two players with very similar offensive skill sets, but I think Sider, um, you know, obviously the clear cut number one in that blue line, Mo Sanderson has the likes of Jabot and Chitrin to contend with for power play time. Um, the Red Wings power play has been great this season as Beebs has already touched on 10th best in the NHL should be very good again next season. The Senators had the league's seventh worst power play by comparison. So, uh, and we know power play time is where the bulk of a fantasy, uh, defenseman's value and production comes from. We've got a situation where Sanderson has more competition for that power play time on a worse unit. So Cider have been more productive to date throughout their respective careers. I don't see any reason to expect anything different next season. So, Again, easy decision for me. I'll go with Cider. I just, you know, I want to shake things up a bit here. I got to go Jake Sanderson, but I do have to drop a little disclaimer here. I originally, uh, originally we had Charlie McAvoy on there and I was going Sanderson over McAvoy, um, which people might find insane. So I'm going to use kind of the same points though for Sanderson here, I guess. Um, but no, I, uh, I, I think this is a, uh, when we put it with Cider, I honestly think this is another case of, just like two guys that are just right next to each other on the list. But I'm going with Jake Sanderson strictly because I think he has a little bit more shot potential than Sider, which 
in turn could lead to goal potential. Um, this year, Sider had 111 shots on net. He capped out at 140 last year. That was his career high. Meanwhile, Jake Sanderson's going to beat that 140 this year. He's at 135 currently. Um, or wait, is he's, he's out. So, or no, he's he's in. So we're good. So he should just crush that uh, that shot on goal total. And for that, I think uh, I'm I'm excited. I uh, I will admit I like the idea of Cider just being committed to that top power play. He should have that. And for that reason, if you want to keep Cider over Sanderson, go for it. But um, you know, things in Ottawa are kind of crazy. People are moving or there's talk of people moving out. Chitron wants to trade every other day. If some bodies move out there, I think that Sanderson could really jump up to a similar role. He currently is only averaging 23 minutes of ice a game. Cider only averaging 22. So that uh that goes bode, bodes a bit better. Yeah, a bit better for Cider as well. Um, so as we're talking here, I'm slowly starting to shift to Team Cider but I shouldn't. Um, so basically I'll just you broke say the tie. that's all that matters. I know. I'll just say the Jake Sanderson potential is what I would go with. But if someone, honestly, if I had to look a child in the eyes and he was asking me cider <laughs> or Sanderson, I think I would have to tell him most cider. You just um, talked yourself story. out of your argument. I love that. I uh, sure gonna, did. Yeah. Honestly, I, I think this one's a little bit closer than D is suggesting it is but um i i think it's i think there's two things that could make a difference here one if chicken does get traded that obviously makes sanderson more valuable but also got um cider's had a nice year and he's done most of it on the second power play unit and shane goss is probably not coming back next year they've got to make room for some of their young defensemen they inexplicably signed justin hole and ben Sherratt to longer term contracts so they're going to be taking up spots so goss is probably not going to return um which opens it up for Cider to be on power play one more next season. So looking ahead to next year, uh, I do think Cider's probably got better potential than he did this year with Goss's bear on the roster. Uh, but again, with Sanderson, if Chikrin gets traded in the off season, then that opens things up for, uh, for Sanderson. So to me, this is pretty neck and neck and it's highly dependent on what happens. So if you have to set your keepers in uh, May, then it might be a tough decision. But if you don't have to set them until uh, next September or October, then uh, we will be fine. The last one we will talk about. Brock, I do have to step in. Uh, Mo Sider did have 187 shots in his rookie season. So I, 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 I sell, sold your boy short at 140. So the people at home are yelling at their their uh, their podcast app right now. It was 187 for him. Um, still a number I think Jake Sanderson can attain. So <laughs> on to the next. You're like a... I don't even know what it's called. You're back and forth, though. Um, what's yeah. that thing at a park that goes up? Seesaw. You're seesaw in here. Um, Teeter totter. Teeter totter. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. Couldn't we come up with it. it. it was, You're the it one was, with uh, kids here. What are we doing? I haven't. Yeah, she's not old enough to go on a teeter totter or a seesaw yet. So I haven't been to the park yet uh, too frequently. Okay, last one. Uh, Beebs, we'll start with you here. Pieter Kachekov or Aiden Hill? Kachekov for me on this one. Um, I blame Logan Thompson. It's your fault, Logan Thompson. You're uh, you have 36 starts this year. You are probably going to take 40 next year, and so is Aiden Hill. I think Vegas has a great thing going right now. Their 50-50 split is excellent. When Hill does play, he's phenomenal. But Kachekov, I believe, has the more potential to take this role going forward. Take it in the long run. Kachekov's 24 years old. Aiden Hill's 27. We're talking about goalies here. Um, I don't think that Frederick Anderson is going to stand in the way of Kotchekov for too much longer. We already saw what uh, happened this year. Not to say that was a total fluke blood clot injury, but Anderson gets hurt every year. It's happened since the dawn of time, since the dinosaurs came out. Um, he gets hurt every year. So it uh, Kotchekov for me, if we would have asked me, this is another case of a month ago, I probably would have gone with Aiden Hill, but Kotchekov just taken such a step forward lately. I guess the last two months, he has truly tr really proven that he is the number one goaltender for a while there. I was worrying if, you know, is this guy even a backup in the league, but he now has a save percentage of uh, 913. Aiden Hill has a 914 this year. I just think, uh, you know, we saw what happened to Hill when he's on a not great team with his previous teams that were very bad that he was on. And maybe not a fair example because, you know, played in San, or San Jose, played in Arizona. But I think Kachekov, the team in front of him is phenomenal. I don't think that there's much 
there's going to be much uh, taking starts from him, at least not as good of a goalie as Logan Thompson. And just overall, I think now that he's proven that he can post that same save percentage, that same goals against average as Hill, I think just going forward, I would bet on him since he is uh, still untapped potential, in my opinion. And I think Hill, we've seen the best that he can give us. And it's pretty good. Way better than I thought it was. But yeah. D, you like Piotr? You like Aiden? Your goal is yeah, I actually lean the other way here. I So there we nice. go. We got a little bit of disagreement on the pod yeah. finally, but... I still, th- I still think the checkoff sees some sort of timeshare with Frederick Anderson next season. Anderson still on the books for next year. He's performed well this year. Or he's looked good anyway since coming back from that injury. And it's, I don't think it's an injury we have to worry about in terms of re-aggravating too much. Obviously, with the blood clotting was unfortunate, but it seems like it's behind him now. No, that's not. I do think yeah, Aiden Hill. That's not happening. Yeah. yeah, I do think Aiden Hill has emerged as the clear number one in Vegas as they continue to turn to him down the stretch here. Uh, Thompson has just two starts in the month of March. Hill's play. It has wavered a bit of late, but I still expect him to be uh, a very reliable fantasy option on a very good team next season that could potentially approach workhorse territory as, you know, Thompson's play continues to drop off a little bit if these last couple months are any indication. So I like to check up down the road, uh, maybe in dynasty formats a little bit more, but I think if I'm projecting for next season at this point, I, I would have Hill ranked above him. Yeah, I think these two will probably be pretty similar in my rankings next year. I think this is a tough one to decide on. Um, I'll probably lean Kachekov slightly uh, just because I I just think the Hurricanes are going to be a better defensive team than the Golden Knights moving forward into next year uh, yet again and insulate them a little bit better. Uh, and Kachekov's play has really been outstanding uh, over the last couple of months. He has a 937 save percentage uh, in his last 12 starts over the exact same sample uh, an 881 save percentage for Aiden Hill. A, a lot of that has to do with the team in front of Aiden Hill. They've been very, very banged up. Um, the one thing about Aiden Hill, man, is uh, sometimes it just looks like he's never going to give up a goal. Like He is just so big, and he can be so, so dominant. But, um, yeah, I think he, th- he's the other proven... Times. Yeah, I, I think he's proving that maybe last year was a, a touch bit fluky, but he's still been very good. I think there's a goalie that they can rely on heading into the playoffs. But it's going to be really interesting, I think, to see uh, – maybe not interesting is probably not the word, but very telling to see what the Hurricanes do in the playoffs. Uh, you know, I don't think you can roll with a timeshare. Do you roll with a the experienced Frederick Anderson, who has played well since returning, or do you continue with Kachekov, who's been absolutely uh, unbelievable for the better part – uh, of a few months here. So uh, even if you go back since Christmas, 928 save percentage in his last 18 starts. So Kachat has been great. Aiden Hill, maybe a little bit more lackluster as of late, but uh, both, I think, like I said, will be very, very similar in my rankings heading into next year. And maybe Kachekov, we can actually talk about being a goalie that you want to draft, not a guy who's going to start the year in the AHL going to the top 100. So uh, that is going to do it for the back and forth. Well, not so much back and forth, just um, the agreement with segment. Each other. Yeah, the agreement segment of the uh, DFO keepers. Um, but yeah, let's, as always, head over now to Dylan D. Berthium, who will guide us through a hectic weekend in the NHL with D's weekend streamers. Thank you, Brock. And now that I have control of the show, I am going to get the last word in here on Aiden Hill. He did have a 930 save percentage on the year less than a month ago. Obviously missed some time. Uh, but I think a little bit of recency bias creeping in here in, in both regards. Kachet got playing his best hockey of the season right now. And Hill, obviously, like you said, rock behind a banged up Vegas team, has struggled of late and really diluted those numbers on the season. So, uh, yeah, Aiden Hill's better. Uh, there's nothing else you guys can say to convince me. Uh, but, no, streamers. Okay, we got four games on Friday, 11 on Saturday, 10 on Sunday. We alluded to it earlier in the show. It's a weird weekend. A lot pickier than we normally would, as you'll likely have a near full lineup already on Sunday. So I'm going to focus more on highlighting a couple of my favorite options for Friday night uh, and guys that can also uh, potentially suit up for you on Sunday uh, if you do have uh, room in your lineup that day. Uh, And again, of course, we're going to look at a couple of goalies. I actually got four goaltenders to mention this weekend uh, because even with 10 games on the slate, there's so many teams going back to back that the chances are you're going to be able to fit an extra goalie start in your lineup on Sunday. But starting off with the skaters, as always, Colorado Avalanche, uh, Beavs and Zabs. They are hosting the Blue Jackets on Friday, the Penguins on Sunday. It's a terrific matchup. Both games on home ice where teams have a really hard time traveling to play at uh, in the Mile High City. Mainly focused on getting some extra bodies into your lineup when they take on the Jackets on Friday. But like I said, they do all the Penguins on Sunday. So if you're looking to get an extra game or two on the last day of the slate, we got a couple of premium options to mention here that are more than likely just available in your shallower leagues. And we'll get into some deeper options later on, but Arturi Lekkinen, 49% owned left wing, right wing. So again, obviously we're talking shallower leagues here, but 
uh, in those shallower formats, good chance he is out there. Uh, 51% of total leagues that he is still on the free agent pool or in the free agent pool, I should say. But he's been on a tear of late. Nine goals, six assists in his last 14 games. Has been relegated to a role in the second line in power play unit, which is what's keeping that ownership uh, level below that 50% threshold. But you wouldn't know what going off that production. Still consistently playing around 20 minutes a night. Uh, so, yeah, I wouldn't overthink this one in one of those 51% of leagues where he is available. Uh, just grab him. The matchup's too good. Uh, and then Casey Middlestad, 28% owned, center eligible, playing alongside Lekin on that second line and power play unit. The newest ab. He was a reliable playmaker for a much worse team in the Sabres. So, uh, no surprise to see that production hold up so far in Denver. Two goals, two assists in his first five in the top center leagues. A great option this weekend. And again, particularly on Friday night when they host the Blue Jackets. Uh, and then moving on, uh, we do got a deep league option here for the Dallas Stars hosting those Penguins on Friday before traveling to Arizona on Sunday. So a nice schedule for the Stars this weekend. Uh, we're going to talk about the stinky oven. Logan Stankovin, uh, 16% owned, center right wing eligible. Uh, he's cooled off a bit of late after a red hot start to his career, but that's a bonus for us this weekend as it's kept him available in over 80% of leagues. Skating alongside the boy Wyatt Johnson and Jamie Bennett, 5v5. The three of them have been outstanding together. They own the puck at even strength, scoring are averaging over 38 scoring chances per 16, 17 high danger chances, 61 expected goals for, but you may be surprised they've been unfortunate to score just 46% of the goals when on the ice together. Uh, so expect some positive regression sooner than later. Uh, but yeah, you heard that right. The rookie was managed nine points in his first 11 games. I think it's 10 and 12 now after tonight, um, despite playing under 60 minutes a night has been unfortunate to not enjoy an even more productive start to his career. So given the matchup spread this weekend, it's as good as they get. Um, and it's as good of a time as ever for that puck luck to start bouncing back their way. I'm all in on Stankovin this weekend. Moving forward, Keeper League's Dynasty League is a terrific ad. And uh, again, yeah, especially worth a pickup this weekend. Uh, and then the Kraken, a uh, couple of names just to mention here that we already talked about a bit earlier in the show. Uh, they are in Arizona on Friday before hosting the Habs on Sunday. So a nice schedule for the Kraken. We talked about how good their schedule is the rest of the season. That starts this weekend. Jordan Everly, right wing, 32% owned, and Matty Beneers, center, 27% owned, both on the table this weekend, playing together at 5v5. On the first power play unit, Ellie Tolvin, I think, worth a punt as well in that same situation with them. All three of them routinely seen around 20 minutes a night. They've been cold of late, but a pair of matchups against the Coyotes and Habs could be just what the doctor ordered to turn that around. Everly in particular has been incredibly unfortunate late. 27 shots on goal in his last nine games, but has found the back of the net just once. So given the volume and the usage, I think Everly is as good a bet to pad your goal totals this weekend as anyone. And finally, uh, we got our goaltenders. Uh, I'm looking at Calvin Picard this weekend. Again, he's 20% owned. Edmonton is in Toronto on Saturday. Uh, and then in Ottawa on Sunday. So I think Picard is a near lock to start that game on Saturday, which would have Picard, uh, or which would lead Picard to take on the Sens in a game where the Oilers will be huge, huge favorites. He's performed well this season. He's been able to take advantage of some cushier matchups. He's got 10 wins and 14 appearances and a 919 save percentage. Look for that good fortune to continue this weekend. Uh, Varlamov on the Islanders, 19% owned. Uh, the Isles host the Jets on Saturday, the Devils on Sunday. Varlamov has a 9-10 save percentage across 19 appearances this year. Saturday is an afternoon game, which does cast a little bit of doubt of whether or not Soroka would actually be hailed out until Sunday's game. But I think given the fact that the Islanders are in the middle of a very tight playoff race right now, they need every point they can get. I don't think they can just write off that against Winnipeg and play their backup. So I do think they have to play the matchups here and give Soroka that game against the Jets Sunday. Uh, and then Jonas Johansson, guy who has we haven't talked about a lot this year because he's played so little since Andre Vasilevsky has returned despite his own struggles. But Johansson, 10% owned. The Lightning are in L.A. on Saturday, in Anaheim on Sunday. Johansson's performance has been rocky at best this year. 888 save percentage across 23 appearances. But he looks set for a dream matchup in Anaheim on Sunday. The Lightning will be heavy favorites in that game. So if you're chasing wins and Picard isn't available, I think Johansson probably your best bet obviously bringing some uh, risk with him in, in terms of those poor splits. Uh, and then finally, Laurent Boursois, 27% owned. The Jets are on Long Island Saturday in Washington Sunday. Boursois has been outstanding when called upon this season. There's a reason we've talked about him so much in this segment all year long. He's recorded back-to-back -back shutouts. Only worry here is that Saturday's game is in the afternoon, so it would not shock me if Boursois plays the front of the back-to-back, -back, and it's actually hell of a kid in the knot on Sunday. So, he is available because that ownership's climbing up. I would hesitate here and just make sure that Hellebuck is confirmed for Saturday before grabbing for Swa for Sunday. That's going to do it 
for these weekend streamers and the ongoing Pietro Kachetkov and Aiden Hill discussion will linger deep into the off season without yeah. question. Thank you guys as always for tuning in, not only to season nine, episode 36, but for all 36 episodes, hopefully this season, it's been a fun ride during the regular season. We're not done yet. We're obviously going to continue to chat throughout the fantasy hockey playoffs, but it uh, this wraps up the fantasy hockey regular season for us. Thank you guys all uh, as always. And hopefully you are riding with us in the playoffs because you have built some championship rosters on the back of this podcast. I'm your host, Brock Segan. This has been the DFO Fantasy Podcast presented to you by Betway. Thank you guys so much. We'll see you guys back here next week. Start building those trophy holders because they're coming. What's up, hockey fans? If you enjoyed that video, then you need to be hitting the subscribe button right here at Daily Faceoff. Exclusive interviews and analysis from our hockey insider, Frank Saravalli, fantasy updates from Brock Sagan, and a daily live show at noon Eastern, Monday through Friday. You don't want to miss any of the fantastic content, so hit that subscribe button.